Hi guys and girls, welcome to the channel. Steve the Transit Camper. Me and baby, with Cat the Dog in the back, are headed off to the crime scene of a very famous Shropshire murder, which goes back to 1984. We're gonna head off to where it all started. So, as we head off to find this house, my memories of this murder, 1984, I was 13 years old, and I can remember my mum and dad talking about it. And I can remember going to school and everybody at school talking about it. And this is a case that wasn't solved for 21 years. So this is where the route begins. We are outside Hilda Morrill's house. And on March the 21st in 1984, Hilda Morrill came home from doing some shopping. She was abducted, put in her own car and taken out to the hills of Shropshire. So Hilda Morrill was born in 1906. She was 78 years old at the time of her abduction. It's believed she had gone shopping on the morning of March the 21st. And when she returned home, there was an intruder in her house who she disturbed. A small fight ensued. And in the end, she was abducted, driven in her own car to a place in Shropshire. Hilda was famous for being a campaigner against nuclear power and the building of Sizewell Nuclear Power Station. And she'd written a paper, which was a citizen's point of view, which sort of described why they were against it. And she was due to make that speech at a inquest, a public inquest, which she never got around to doing. Her nephew, Robert Green, believed that her involvement in nuclear power and her activism was the reason why she was abducted and murdered. And there's lots of conspiracy theories around this. And we're just gonna go over some of the facts and see what we think. And we'll tell you at the end. So the paper that Hilda was due to present was called An Ordinary Citizen's View of Radioactive Waste Management. And there were lots of people in the government and in the nuclear industry, oh, cat the dog, who were very much against her reading this statement out. It wasn't until March the 24th, some three days later, before the police made the connection of Hilda Murrell being reported missing from her home and her car that had been dumped in the fields of Shropshire. So her neighbour at the time, a chap called Brian George, first raised the alarm that Hilda was missing. That was some two or three days later when he went round the house and he wanted to know where she was. He'd noticed that the lights were on, but other people were beginning to say they hadn't seen Hilda for a while. He went round the house, first going to the back door, which was left open. There was rain inside the hallway. He walked into the house and noticed a couple of handbags. He noticed her purse was out, but nothing that raised his suspicions too bad. He called for her, there was no reply. He went into the hallway and towards to go up the stairs and he noticed one of the banisters had been broken at the top of the stairs. And as he went up the stairs, things just didn't look right. There was a few things laying around where it looked as though a little struggle had happened. So he raised the alarm, he contacted the police and the investigation started there. So when the police got to the house, there was three days worth of mail inside the house and it had been untouched. They moved into the kitchen and once again noticed the handbag, noticed the purse and noticed some of the drawers and cupboards had been opened. When they went up the stairs again, they noticed that the banister rail had been broken and I've included some of the pictures of the inside of the house. They then went into a back bedroom where they find a tissue and a petticoat that she, which is an undergarment in England, if you don't know, and that had signs of semen stains on it. They went into the bathroom. There was a can, an empty can of beer had been placed in the toilet basin and it had been partially drunk. When forensics came in, they found a palm print underneath the toilet seat where it had been lifted up. And all of this was saved as evidence. One of the main things that they were really concerned about was the phone line had been ripped out from the wall. 
so it would have been impossible to make a call from the house or receive a call to the house. Their theory at the time was that Hilda Murrell had returned from shopping. She'd partially put some of her shopping away. She'd gone upstairs to get changed where she had met her intruder. There they think she was beaten up a little bit, uh, which the autopsy showed bruising to her face and hands and defensive marks. She was also taken into a back bedroom where some kind of sexual assault happened they're not sure, too sure exactly what it was, but they find evidence of a sexual attack. And then they consider that she was taken down the stairs, bundled into her own car and driven off. She owned a white Renault 5 at the time. What we're gonna do now is drive that route and we will drive the exact route that her abductor took and we'll get to the field where her car was found and we'll go from there. So this is the house. I'm not gonna to show too much of it because it's obviously a private dwelling. This happened many years ago, but that is Ravencroft and the house is still called the same. Right, we're gonna head off up this route and we're gonna show you exactly where Hilda Morrill was driven by her abductor in her own car. So the abductor drove the white Renault along this road very erratically and the first witness on the corner of this road reported erratic driving and he made a description of a chap between 25 and 35 driving a white Renault with an elderly lady in a floppy hat in the passenger seat. He then drove at speed along this road and came to the island where he went straight across into the town. to recreate the exact route guess what you're not allowed to turn right <laughs> but what he did do was turn right here to go up Monkmore Road what we'll have to do is a bit of a diversion and get back on track as soon as we can So we are back on the route now. We've missed about 400 yards of Monkmore Road, but that's fine. So we came straight down, we turned right, and this is that road that it leads you to called Monkmore Road.
the police station, which is on your right. Lots of open windows. Lots of chance for the police to see a car traveling at speed, turning left here at this island. just going over wasn't here back in 1984 I think that was just a straight road Heathgates Island with the pub on the right called the Heathgates pub which you'll see as we pass and this is where that white Renault turned off up towards Holman Hill a very popular beauty spot at the time. very much different back in 1984 all that you see on your right is brand new these are all new builds in the last sort of 20 years it was just countryside to our right this little mini island that feeds that estate obviously wasn't there and the white Renault proceeded up this road again I don't know for sure but I don't think this island existed either this formed part of the new road part of the ring road that goes around Shropshire or around Shrewsbury well I think this was now turning into a country lane and heading off now 
towards Hormond Hill and the Shropshire countryside. So we're just a few hundred yards from where we think the car came to its final rest. And we think the car was traveling that fast that Hilda had made several attempts to pull the car over. And the driver lost control and ended up putting the car in a ditch. Bends are very tight, so it, there was obvious reason for him to lose control if he's fighting with a feisty lady driving at speed along these lanes. We're just going to pull up here because it's a good place to stop and once again check our bearings. So we're pretty confident we found the exact place. Uh, looking ahead on the dash cam, we think the car was in the ditch on the, on the left as we look at it now, but it would have been on the right as he's coming back from Shrewsbury. So we think the car ended up there. And we think 
that Hilda Murrell had got out of the car and ran down as far as this gate, which is on our left. I'll show you that in a minute. And then had tried to run from her, her abductor, but she was soon caught. So as we said, the farm, there's another farm just behind us and it's only like a hundred yards away. These gates have clearly got a padlock on them and this is very much private land. There's signs all over the place that say, keep out, keep out, keep out. So we are not gonna get out of the van and go and investigate because we don't wanna get into trouble. And it's a bit weird, isn't it? It is the scene of a grotesque crime at the end of the day. So what we're gonna do is head up to another spot and see if we can get the drone out. So as I said, we are in the area. This is the scene. And it's, I don't know, it's quite sad really. Let me show you a bit more of how I interpret this. I think I'm gonna be right, but let me show you. down that hole like you wouldn't believe. <laughs> so amazingly, when I take the drone up, we're actually completely wrong, which you kind of come to expect when you're looking at Google Earth, but it's actually this field for sure, because I've flown the drone up over it and up in that corner over there, is the moat that you would have seen, which I pointed out on the map. So Hilda Murrell would have run through probably this gate that wasn't here before. And then this area here was Lover's Lane. And she would have ran along this hedgerow. Her items would have been found here. She'd have carried on along that hedgerow and she was found in that small group of trees over there some 400 yards off the road. And that is the actual place. Under the shadow of the Reekin. Which then puts the car along this road, which now I think about orientates everything properly. And the car would have actually come from that direction swerved off the road 
and been found parked on the right here. So that equates to those pictures now, and that's right because you've got the reeking in the background, which you can see on the photos. So pretty grim. Right, I'm gonna head back in the van now because it does feel a bit uncomfortable here. And I do feel as though this is a place that I shouldn't really be, I'll be honest. And I don't wanna be a tourist looking at murder scenes. And I have to explain myself, that's a bit weird. Right, let's get back in the van. And I'll tell you a bit more about the story. Cat's listening in. She's interested in history as well. So the police were called to the car by the farmer that had been dumped there on the actual day that the car arrived. And the first time they visited, a police officer looked at the car. He saw that there was uh, sort of bird watching equipment in there, some books and things like that. So he put it down to just a car that had pulled up in a lay-by and that the person was out walking and nothing else was done at that point. So round about the next day, the 22nd, the farmer once again informed the police that there was a car that had been dumped, a white Renault, and he wanted it moving. So the police turned up, they took the registration of the vehicle and they tried to find the owner, locating it through Swansea, through the DVLA. Unfortunately, and I haven't been able to find the facts on this. Unfortunately, it looks as though they gave uh, an error in the registration, so they never... <laughs> Do you have to breathe down my ear? So they never managed to link the car directly to Hilda Murrell. So it wasn't until the third visit on the 24th of March, 1984, that the police turned up once again to have a look at the car. This time they got the game, the local gamekeeper's wife to come along and she brought a couple of dogs with her and they started to do a search. They ended up going through this gate to my right and they had a good walk around. They didn't find anything for a good while, but they did find her glasses. Then as they advanced forward, the policeman noticed something in that coppice and they found the body of Hilda Murrell. So Hilda Murrell wasn't hidden. She was in that coppice. She was lying on her right side. She was naked from the waist down. She was wearing a coat as well, which had all been pulled up. And <laughs> what is this cat doing? She is desperate to get out. I'm gonna leave this in because this is what I'm up against trying to do a really sensible documentary. She's already pegged it across the field. There she goes, look. She's still making her way out. She's shouting, freedom! <laughs> she's totally escaped out the back of my yeah. across the field. I got the drone out. She'd already escaped. Run, <laughs> run across the field. I had to chase her and tell her off. Then I dropped the drone. Everything went bad. I'm trying to make this really serious. Can I just have the camera so I can show what she looks like from this angle? Babe wants the camera to show what cat looks like. And this is what I'm up against when I'm trying to do something serious for the channel. Cat, <laughs> you are just hell-bent on escaping, aren't what, you? What is your plan, Cat? What is your plan? It's really funny because as soon as Cat gets into the front, she wants to get into the back again. <laughs> so this is that gate where we think she ran through. We're inside the van and I've shown you all of this. But that is the area where a body was found over there. So once the police had found the body of Hilda Murrell and they'd linked it to the car and they'd linked it to the address some three days after she went missing, the investigation ensued. And the problem was it had now been three days. The body had been out in that woodland in the pouring rain for three days and there was very little evidence around. So the only evidence they had was at the house and witnesses from the car journey to get here. And lots came forward, over 30, as I said. The case did go cold because it had been so long since she'd been abducted and it wasn't solved for another 21 years when the case was reopened in 2002. We'll tell you more about that and who did this a bit later. So after all our adventures and around that field, we are now called into Hormond Hill 
and we're going to go to the cafe and get a coffee. Superb. Couldn't be any better this crime scene, could it? I don't think the cafe will be open. She doesn't think the cafe will be open. I know for a fact it is. Perfect. On closer inspection, it transpires that the cafe is not open. How annoying is that? But there is a beautiful seating area here on Holmond Hill. Cat's enjoying a run round. We haven't brought a picnic. But just to show you how lovely this beautiful spot in Shropshire is. Very popular in the summer. So sorry if it's a bit windy, but there were two main theories that came out of this conspiracy. And it took 21 years to solve, and that's why these conspiracies come along, really, these conspiracy theorists. The first one that was she was abducted by the nuclear industry and tortured uh, for three days and then murdered and left in the woods. I don't think that's true. And the second one is because her nephew worked for the uh, Royal Navy in the, let me just have a look, his name was Robert Green and he was working in naval intelligence and they thought he was involved in the sinking of Belgrano and the start of the Falklands War, which they think was all a setup to trigger the Falklands War. You know, that's a conspiracy. And they thought that she had shared documents with her nephew and that she had stored them in her house. And they said that people from MI5 had gone over to the house, had been searching the house, looking for these documents and to try and uh, get Robert Green into trouble, her nephew. And she came home and disturbed them, so they couldn't find the document. So in the end, ended up driving her to that field, taking her to a hut that was located nearby, which we've never found, and torturing her over two and a half days, eventually dumping her out in that field and left to die. So it went through Parliament. There's lots of uh, Parliament docu documents that you can download. Uh, about people questioning the government and what really happened in the Hilda Murrell case. This has been since investigated by several people. Um, there's a good YouTube video that I'll put a link to here, which basically debunks all of that nonsense. And I think it is nonsense. It's spurred on a number of books all about the abduction and the murder. And I think it's just lots of people making lots of money with ridiculous conspiracy theories. I'm not going to give it the time of day. I'm going to tell you the actual facts and what happened 21 years later when they reinvestigated the case. Very interesting stuff. But I'm not going to tell you just yet. You have to stay to the end. It is really cold. We're going back to the van. I've paid £2.36 to park here. For how long? Six, seven minutes. Ooh, that really grates on me. That is expensive. Paid for two hours at £2.36. Yeah, it's too cold for us. Isn't it, baby? Yeah. We're going back. Cat likes it. But she's actually getting back to the van before us. Yeah, she's going to the van. <laughs> she that lock, she'll peg it. Baby thinks she's going to peg it. Baby thinks she's going to peg it as soon as she hears the van open. When she realises what we're doing. <laughs> she is funny. Right, let's get back. Well, Kat did not let me down. Or, well, she did kind of. We clicked the van to open it and she pegged it. Ran up to... Back to where we've <laughs> She just ran come up from. to back up there where we'd come from. But I encouraged her, I said, come on, cat. And she ran straight back and even jumped into the van herself. So she didn't let me down there. So I'm very proud of my little girl. And she knows that the next destination, she's probably going to be left alone for a bit. What we've done is we've sat here now. It's freezing cold. We've sat here. Uh, we've looked at all of that area and there is nowhere to properly stealth camp. It's private land. We don't want to arouse any suspicion. I think if we were even wild camping, it would be risky because it's quite an open field. So we're not going to do that. What we're going to do is look for somewhere close by and uh, stealth camp there, but we're going to go in search of some Guinness because what's a stealth camp without Guinness? It's just not a stealth camp on Steve the Transit Camper. So we're going to go and do that. We're going to go and find a pub, park there, Perhaps have something to eat. I'm yawning. She's yawning.
<laughs> Perhaps have something to eat? Maybe, yeah. Maybe. I think it's got to be said you found this completely boring, this video, haven't you, baby? I think it's not so much the video, it's the constant, however long it's already been going on in our house. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of research, so I've watched the same video many, many, many times. And I wanted to do a half decent job of this. I'm not an investigator. <coughs> Believe it or not, I do not work for the MI5, despite what people think. This is just me trying to recreate some of the history of when I was 13 and remembering all those uh, conversations around Hilda Murrell. And I never knew any of this. I thought Hilda Murrell lived in a mansion well outside of Shrewsbury. I thought somebody had broken in. I thought she was murdered in her own home and that it took 21 years to solve. How wrong was I? So it is quite a good little mystery. It's very heartbreaking and we've got the utmost respect for the family because this wouldn't have been pleasant at the time and not pleasant for a 78-year-old lady to be put through this. Anyway, let's head off to a pub. Baby has found the perfect place, so we're going to head there now. And it's called the Horseshoes, and it's in a place called Uckington, which is only about two miles from the location. So we're, we're there, thereabouts. So let's head off there and I'll tell you a bit more of the story. So we're traveling again and we're off to the horseshoes at Uckington. Left or right, baby? Left. Left it is. I would like to say as well, as you know, I'm a nurse and uh, I work nights at the local hospital. And the amount of elderly people that I've had conversations with and I've brought up the subject over the last week or so while I've been studying this. Yeah left turn about Hilda Morrill and their knowledge of the crime is absolutely fabulous so I've had some really good conversations and uh, it's just fascinating that they lived at the same time and some of them can recall the police knocking on their door who lived local to Ormond Hill asking them if they'd seen anything haven't found a living witness yet but I think I will because, as I said, the hospital is uh, very much full of elderly people who would probably have been in their sort of 30s at the time when all this happened. Interesting stuff. And for those people that are turning up to my channel, Steve the Transit Camper, thank you very much. Hope you're enjoying this one. My channel's all about stealth camping, so I've got a transit van we go to various places and we go stealth van camping all over the place really we're heading off to France in when August so we'll try and do a couple of stealth camps there as well all exciting stuff we also do wild camping in the sort of stealth form we never pay for camping very rarely and that's me and baby and the boy and sometimes just me and baby on our own and cat the dog of course so do stick around give us a like give us a subscribe and follow the adventures of steve the transit camper it would be much appreciated so we're coming up to our stealth camp location which is here almost missed the turn then and there are a couple of great car parks that are far enough from the pub they won't even know that we're there. They won't think twice. There were two car parks that I Google Earthed. One at the front, which is this one. That seems pretty good over there, really, to be honest, because we can have the side door facing the head. So if cat needs a wee, we can do a discreet jobby. Let's have a look. Cat can do discreet. Stop bullying the cat. He's a dog. This is perfect. So, before we go into this pub, so before we go in search of the Guinness, let's talk about the autopsy and what their findings were. And I've wrote a few things down. 
So she had multiple bruising to her face. She had been stabbed several times in the abdomen, hands and arm, of which there was defensive wounds. She was partly clothed and they found the car keys in her pocket. The coroner decided that the cause of death was hypothermia. So he'd beaten her up a few times in different places they decided. And when she tried to run away, he'd obviously got angry as well and give her another beating, eventually taking her to the coppice where he beat her a few more times and he clearly thought he'd killed her. Sadly, he hadn't. So they think that she was still alive a good two days lying in that woods, unable to help herself. So it's very sad. So she actually died of the cold, which is awful. The person who also did the autopsy concluded that the stab wounds in her abdomen were either inflicted as the person was driving her when they abducted her and stabbing her in the passenger seat just to keep her from grabbing the steering wheel, I suppose, and trying to pull the car off the road. And also that her hyoid had been squashed, the bone in her neck here, where he'd got around the neck. And they think that he'd also inflicted some stab wounds as he pulled her backwards into the forest. So it was quite horrific, really. And her hands were covered in knife wounds. I've got some pictures that I found from a documentary. Let me show you those. And it shows clearly what wounds she had. Going back to the house, another key piece of evidence that was found in the house was uh, trainer footprints. And they were in the kitchen, I believe. And they kept those footprints for if they ever identified a suspect. A key piece of evidence, it turned out. While I think about it, one of the best documentaries that I found, and if you type in Hilda Morrill into YouTube, it only comes up with about five videos, uh, hopefully six now, maybe even seven, because I did a little advert thinking, see? Anyway, there are two people who did an investigation in the documentary, and that was Rita Wilkinson and John Stalker. And I think it's called the Stalker Investigation or something like that. And John Stalker is a retired detective and so was Rita Wilkinson, who he chose especially to have a look at all the evidence and they were given full access to everything. And their conclusion is pretty much the same as mine. Right, let me tell you this now. We've turned up at this pub, which may be picked, and it is now 5.25 in the day. And I'm not allowed to go in the pub now because baby said, I'll get too excited, I'll drink too much Guinness, and it'll ruin everything. Unbelievable, isn't it? So we're waiting now until she says, that's enough time for me not to ruin everything, and then we can have a nice meal. I sense control, do you sense control? She's saying nothing. Six minutes later, we're allowed to go. So if I'd have gone six minutes earlier into that pub, oh, I wouldn't have been able to hold myself. I'd have drunk 27 pints. But because that six minutes has gone past, I'm safe, apparently. Is that true, baby? No comment. Let's get in there, find the Guinness. We were just gonna get out of the van and baby's come up with an absolutely amazing idea. We pulled this down which we never use, hence it's superbly clean. And she said, why don't we cut through there and have a little place that cat can come in and out? That, my lover, is a brilliant idea. And that will be a project on the channel. Let's go. Right, let's crack on, bit windy. There's the stealth spot. Perfect. Why are you showing us that? I'm giving you a beer mat. Oh. Absolutely beautiful place, and 
what we've got is the Murphys. I like any stout and I would drink Murphys if that was the opportunity in most places, but it's not, but this is perfect. Cheers. That is so good. Imagine if we'd come here seven minutes earlier. I've got my fifth or sixth now. No comment. It wasn't actually six or seven minutes, was it? It was like an hour or something ago. You're just picking it off, trying to make me look like a nasty wife. You're trying to say that I'm hoodwinking my audience. Yeah. Exactly what you're doing. Others might call it bullying. And I was going to keep quiet, but I should keep going on about it. Yeah, but I get to edit this and I can cut that out. I'll comment. She'll comment. Better leave it in. Anyway, we could have a drink now. <laughs> Baby's just said, Look, we've only been here 10 minutes. She said, Look at your drink. <laughs> I'm being monitored here. Yeah, it's all right. I'm gonna go and get another one now. Yes, but then you'll be sick in the afternoon. <laughs> we'll be sick. Do you, do you want to talk about being sick? Do you want to talk about who was the last to be sick? Two nights in a row. That was a two off. Most people refer to incidents as a one-off. Oh, that was a one-off. Baby says, oh, that was a two-off, because she did it twice. Two nights in a row. <laughs> two nights in a row. I wasn't very well. Vomiting poorly. in the van. I was poorly and he was making me go out and attend parties that I didn't want to be at. So he deserves it. I can't help it, I'm a socialite. I was ill. Unbelievable. So I was holding her hair up like a good husband while she was puking in the back of the van. In the toilet, in the back of the van. Well, in the toilet, yeah, yeah. but it's still disgusting. Well, what I went, when you were sick, I never complained once, did I? I can't remember this incident. When you drank a full bottle of whiskey at the Filipino party. That was enjoyable. You were in the right state. Oh, we've been invited to another Filipino party. And we are definitely going to video it. It's not till September, but it'll be amazing. I'm going to take a bottle of honey whiskey. What are you taking, baby? A bottle of Bacardi? Water. Water. So I can want it to you. Unbelievable. I'm going to go and get another pint. Hey! <laughs> Looks nice, baby. I'm a little disappointed in mine. There wasn't an awful lot of flavour, but I thought I'd better eat it anyway. Here's the main, that's mine, brisket. Got some extras, and that's babies. Awesome. Well, that was an excellent meal, and we have got something for cat. She'll love that, a sample of all the meats. <laughs> Very reasonable. Oh, nice ring, baby. <laughs> Heading out now, baby's nip into the loo. Well, that was an excellent meal. We're gonna head up for the stealth now. And we'll give Cat her little treats. It's what, 20 past eight now? It's just on the turn. <laughs> I've got hiccups. <laughs> We're gonna head into the van and I'll give you the end of the story. And you'll know what happened to the late and great Hilda Morrow. We are expecting all of these cars to disappear as we stealth camp on their car park. I finally convinced Baby that it's much better to have a wee in the pub 
not in the van when we get back. She always says, oh no, I prefer to go in the van. And I say, no babe, go for a toilet in a pub and then we might not have to use the porta potty. <laughs> and here we are heading back to the stealth van for a nice free night. I'm gonna probably watch a movie now, are we, baby? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We're not American. A film, it's we're a not film. American. A movie to the Americans. It's Let's see if Cat the dog has gone into the front. Hopefully she hasn't. Right, let's crack on. Well, somebody <laughs> is a very bad dog. She is in the front. <laughs> So she's giving our game away constantly. We're going to get in the she's back. She's only just started doing that. Yeah. She never used to do it. Brand new thing this is for Cat the Dog. Look at her. She's gorgeous. She's so naughty. We're in the back now and she's stuck in the front. Come on, Cat. Pretending she doesn't know how to do it. <laughs> oh, she's so naughty. We just need 10 minutes of heating. So we'll pop that on. Right, cabin fever has got in the front, but she needs to have a wee. Let's get her sorted and then we can feed her. Come on, cat. Look at this, perfect. No one can see us. Go and have a wee. Have a wee. Quickly. Have a wee. So excited because she can smell the beef. Have a wee. Here she is. Cat's had a wee. She's sorted. Let's feed her now. So this is what we saved for this beautiful little animal. She's so excited. Let's see if she actually tastes anything. So here we are. This is beef brisket. Get back. Wait. 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 Look how good she is. Go on in. She is so excited to eat that. Beef brisket and belly pork. That will allow her to survive for the next 12 hours. Nice cat. Look at her. She cannot get over that. That is quality meat as well. It was excellent, the food. Disappointed with the soup starter. Lacked a bit of flavour, didn't it, Monkey? Yeah, I make a nicer soup than that. Yeah, you do make a nicer soup than that. But it was okay once we peppered it up ourselves. She's got water, so no moaning, people. So I expect you want to hear the end of the story. Well, the conspiracy theories all went out of the window once... Operation Nimbus started in 2003. They looked at all the evidence that was associated with Hilda Morrell's death. So in 1984, DNA was virtually non-existent for being able to test and link to an individual. But in 2003, things had changed and under Operation Nimbus, everything was sent off to the labs and when the sample came back, they got a hit. The handkerchief that was found in the back bedroom delivered no hits, no DNA found. But the lady's slip, or what do they call it? Undergarments, did come back with a positive DNA match. And that was linked to a definite individual. The individual was a person that had been questioned at the time. He was a 16 year old and he was a petty thief. He lived in a place called Bestford House, which was for homeless children or for children that were too difficult to manage at home with their parents. So they went to live at this place called Bestford House. They identified this chap. Let me show you a picture of him. And his name Andrew George. In 2005, the original investigator was given the task to go 
to the Shrewsbury home of the man whose DNA matched Andrew George. He was a 35 year old builder's labourer and he lived not far from the crime scene, really. Uh, he was arrested and promptly charged with her murder. Andrew George was taken into police custody and he was questioned. They asked him if he owned a pair of trainers. He said no, this was at the time of the murder. Later on in Operation Nimbus, it was proven that the guy did own a pair of trainers. They went back to Besford House and they looked at the inventory as a 16 year old lad when he moved in and listed in there was a pair of trainers. His family backed the story that he never wore trainers and yet it was in his possession when he moved into Besford House. Also at the time of questioning, when he was a 16 year old, he gave an alibi that he was in Woolworths playing on the games. He used to be able to go into Woolworths, and I remember this as a kid, and used to be player on the computer games, and if you got one that you liked, the idea was that you enjoyed it so much you would buy it. Nobody ever did, the kids just played the games, as you can imagine. He said that he was there that day, all day, playing the games in Woolworths. In Operation Nimbus, they met with the Woolworths manager, they talked about his name and straight away the Woolworths manager said, I know that kid and he was banned from the store and he'd been banned from the store for many months before this happened. So there's no way he was in Woolworths playing on those games. So there you go. So overall, the police theory was that Andrew George, a petty thief and known for thieving around Shrewsbury, many, many different households and had been in trouble many, many times. The police decided or they figured out that Andrew George had been in the property prior to Hilda Murrell returning home on March the 21st from her shopping. She had come into the house. She'd partly dispatched all her shopping into the areas it needed to go and then went upstairs to get changed, ready to go out for an, an arrangement that she'd got. She went up the stairs and she was confronted by her attacker, Andrew George, a 16 year old who had, as I said, broke into the house, helped himself to a can of lager, was happily going about his business, looking through her things and stealing stuff of value, including some money out of her purse. She was a feisty lady. She wasn't going to hang back. She probably went straight for him and defend, tried to defend herself and get him to leave her house. He then attacked her tied her up and he used the cover off her ironing board to tie her to that post that was upstairs that baluster rail she he then subjected her to some sort of sexual attack then he bundled her downstairs into her own car and drove her to the place where she was finally found deceased Nobody knows why he did that. And when it came to court in 2005, the investigators didn't get him to confess to what actually happened on that day. So still to this day, he's not said that he did it. He still says that he had nothing to do with it. And what he did in fact say was he blames his brother, who was called Stephen George, and the police couldn't link Stephen George to any of it. So an horrendous crime. Nobody knows why he drove her out to that hill. Nobody knows what his intentions were at the time. He was just a sad individual that got caught robbing and just panicked. And that's what they think happened. Conspiracy theories completely out of the window once DNA matched. So for 21 years, you know, through Parliament, through all of... Uh, that, that conspiracy theory with the nuclear power and th those people and MI5, all of that became null and void once they'd matched that DNA. His solicitor still says that Andrew George is saying he had nothing to do with the incident, but he does now admit to being in her home at the time when she arrived back from her shopping. Uh, he came up for parole last year in July after serving 15 years in prison for a life sentence. The minimum he must serve is, was 15 years. He came up for parole and the parole board said no. But he is due for parole again this year 
and it's very, very likely it'll be released over the next sort of three years. So there you go. That's what happened to Hilda Murrell. Very, very sad case. And one that uh, had a big influence on me when I was 13 year old. Very sad. Baby's desperately trying not to cough. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Unbelievable. So there we are. Andrew George was the killer. Still denies it to this day, but he doesn't deny being in the house when she returned home. He's guilty. We all know that. And that's the case of Hilda Murrell. Right, so I hope you've enjoyed all of that. It's a bit of true crime. We're very, very much interested in true crime, me and baby. And that was a story that was local to us. And I hope you enjoyed it. That was the case of Hilda Murrell. And a very sad one it is. I'm going to get into the back of the van now, get undressed and get under that duvet because I'm freezing. So we are all in bed now. That is the view from the cameras. Bit boring tonight, really. Nothing's going to go on there, I would think. And we're going to get some sleep. OK, guys and girls, we are all tucked up in bed. We're going to say good night. I'll try and record some footage overnight, but I've forgotten to put the DJI on the roof and I can't be bothered to get out now. So we'll catch you in the morning. Good night all. Good night, baby. throat in the world so <laughs> did you hear that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that sounded like cabin fever just woke up as well and did a big shake <laughs> we're both getting very poorly it's two minutes to five and it's pitch black out there We've, neither of us have slept very well. Here she comes. Good Here comes Cat the dog. Good morning. Come on then. She wants to be on camera, she said. Here she is. Stop licking. Why do you always have to be so invasive? Hey, Cat the dog. That's it. You've had your kiss. Good morning. Uh, you're blocking all the views and everything, Cat. Thank you. It's all over my face now. Attractive. <laughs> so, as I said, both poorly. Really annoying, to be honest. Because we've both got eight days off, haven't we, off work? I've got ten. She's got ten. And on day one, I've got a temperature and a sore throat. And baby has said... She feels as though she's getting ill now. Brilliant. All right, let's have a look at the camera, see if we can see anything. Not a lot to see there, really. The light in the car park's gone off, so that's the view we've got. Okay. Right, we've had a meeting. <laughs> I didn't really get a vote, did I? I should have filmed the meeting. Our meetings are really interesting because what we do is throw a few ideas together and then baby tells us what we're doing. It's very democratic, isn't it? Yeah. So she says, let's just go home and be ill. I thought, yeah, that's a good one. So that's what we're going to do. 
I'll uh, film the journey home and just speed that up. But we'll be traveling in the dark. <laughs> Hope you've enjoyed this one. All about Hilda Morrill and that terrible crime that happened. Something a bit different and we thought it'd be something a bit interesting. Hope I pulled it off. See you next time you watch your Steve the Transit Camper. Take care. Bye for now. Here she is, cabin fever. Look at her. She knows I'm going to get out. And she wants a wee. So let's get her sorted. Pitch black out here. Very fresh morning. Nothing to really see. But we position the van so a cat can have a wee and nobody will see us. Perfect. Are you done? Right, as I said, I'm going to get in the van. You've been watching Steve the Transit Camper. Take care.